Please be seated. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Paolo Palmieri. Uh, Professor Palmieri teaches history and philosophy of science at the University of Pittsburgh. With a focus on European modernity in the 17th century, his many interests include Montessori method, pragmatism, phenomenology, post-humanism, and their intersection with the sciences. I should uh, add that he has done some wonderful work, and this is uh, perhaps most relevant to what we do here, in uh, investigations of the experimental work of Galileo. Uh, however, for our audience tonight, I think the highest commendation I can give is the very high regard that, uh, that uh, in which he was held uh, by our dear former dean and uh, longtime tutor, in fact, dean on both campuses, Curtis Wilson, who, who died recently. Um, uh, uh, Curtis Wilson uh, uh, gave uh, Professor Palmieri the honor of, of, of uh, he commended Professor Palmieri's work to, to us by uh, a lengthy and appreciative article in the St. John's Review. And, uh, and worked closely with, with uh, Professor Palmieri on, on several of his books. Um, so uh, uh, I'm sure he'll have interesting things to say to us. He's going to be concentrating more on Galileo's philosophy. I would like to say uh, in particular that, that um, in, uh, thinking of Curtis Wilson, uh, Professor Palmieri combines within himself uh, 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 Curtis's uh, 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 brilliance in experimental work combined with a deep sensitivity for the, the philosophical and, uh, and, and, some, and theological uh, context of much of the work that, uh, that uh, he has studied. Professor Palmieri. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Uh, thank you very much. What a pleasure to be here tonight. And what a pleasure um, to um, remember Professor Curtis Wilson. Um, my relationship with Curtis began many, many years ago because I sent him an article when I was still a student in Bologna, at the University of Bologna, I was doing my dissertation there, and uh, uh, one of my supervisors suggested that I should send this article to Professor Wilson, and I did. And at that time, um, people still used to uh, uh, print and read manusc um, real, real manuscript, not not PDFs, uh, and so. Curtis uh, read this very, very long manuscript, it was incredibly long, and filled it uh, with red and blue marks. <laughs> and, and, and that was the way our relationship uh, began. And every time I, I send him an article, uh, he used to say, well, you know what to expect, lots of red and blue marks. <laughs> so that's how I, I improved um, my scholarship over, you know, for almost 10 years. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill, for the introduction. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about something which I've been developing recently, and it's still part of this lifelong uh, love affair which I have with Galileo. I've been involved with Galileo for many, many years. Um, but recently I focused on, on things which for a long time puzzled me and I would like to begin to make sense of this puzzlement with you tonight because this is the first time I've given this lecture and I, it's the first time I've talked about this uh, puzzlement. So as you will see, we will take off in a slightly different direction tonight with respect to the um, work which uh, Bill was mentioning I did um, in the laboratory trying to recreate Galileo's experiments. So it's, it's a bit late and 
uh, I know this, uh, I read the letter, the letter um, from the dean, and it explained to me that uh, this is part of a series of lectures and a little bit more formal, so I thought that this is fine, I'm going to read. And here and there I will also comment. Now, uh, uh, I, have an, I have an accent, yes, yes, I speak fluently, um, I speak good Italian. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, I still think in Italian, so I try to do my best to, to um, convey this in English, but still this is, is, is um, it's, uh, Italian in, in disguise. Okay. Um, all right, so if you don't understand me, just raise your hand and I will repeat in the sa exactly the same. You won't understand anyway, so. Um, <laughs> Galileo's Hermeticism, matter, self, and light. Now, um, let's see if I can see what I The myth of origins that has been handed down to us by the high priests of 19th century positivism, has it that Galileo was the founder of modern mathematical experimental science and that his revolutionary achievement consisted in dismantling the constructs of the late medieval cosmos, which is to say, in eradicating its roots in the doctrines of Aristotle and his late scholastic followers. Now, undoubtedly, there are elements of truth in this, as in all myths. But the myth also conceals, I believe, deeper layers of meaning which are buried in our collective unconscious and in the cultural traditions of Western civilization. Over the last 100 years or so, scholars have tended to perpetuate this image of Galileo sort of the, uh, hero in his heroic quest for new knowledge regardless of, of social and intellectual, uh, regardless of scholars, their own social or intellectual orientation. So this has been the tendency. Uh, the image has featured Galileo in different postures, for example, as the trailblazer of modern experimental method, or as the creator of mathematical physics, or the founder of telescopic astronomy, who, let's say, abolished the Greek or Christian heavens. Um, this is a line which I take from Brecht um, play on the life of Galileo, abolishing the heavens. I like that. Uh, but also as, for example, the uncanny appropriator of late medieval philosophies of science, which were rooted in the logical doctrines of Aristotle. So the image of Galileo prevailing in the 20th century um, has been that of a natural philosopher which was intent on pursuing rational rules of inquiry by fair means or foul, depends on which, how you look at it, and uh, as a pathway to establishing objective truth about the material universe. In this project, I try to sort of renounce this positive, positivist legacy, though I do not wish to negate it completely, as it, um, I think it, it has become part and parcel with our cultural consciousness. I try to, let's say, um, implicate my inquiry within a process of integration of the deeper layers of meaning that can be recovered from that legacy by reconfiguring Gal what I call Galileo uh, or Galilean mythologems. You have this word in English, mythologem? Okay, good. So if, sometimes you will hear strange words, but... Um, when I, when I studied English with my, with my teacher, I, I insisted, I said, this word is in the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, he said, and he used to say, it doesn't mean anything, we don't use it. <laughs> uh, uh, Galileo's natural philosophy largely exceeded, if not violated, early modern norms for scientific research as they were codified, for instance, in the teachings on a regressus of the Paduan Aristotelians. Um, in addition to this, for example, it's been suggested that it is totally misleading to construe Galileo's project as a precursor of modern science, whose fundamental institution emerged only later on in the 19th century. And I, and I agree with this judgment. So I understand Galileo's labors as a search for 
uh, let's say, individuation within, within her, her sort of hermetic life world, which was permeable to conflicting and different cultural currents. From this more integrative perspective, Galileo's natural philosophy can be seen as an instrument of personal healing, not so much as a rigid, rigid doctrinal corpus, but uh, as a laboring at the identification of his own individuality. Now, the labors took the form of an inquiry into nature, but the hidden complex, I believe, behind these labors were, was really a longing for self-knowledge, or if you like to borrow an alchemical metaphor, for the liberation of a spiritual Mercurius, Galileo's own self, uh, from the darkness of the material body. So here my strategy is to integrate um, this, uh, this analysis into a broader narrative exploring the deeper layers of uh, European culture from which the powerful myth eventually emerged. The project highlights all these inter intersections of Galileo's existential pathway with early modern traditions that have been rejected or marginalized by the rise of the natural sciences in the 19th century. So the project portrays Galileo's whose processes of self-edification self bordered on heresy and sometimes libertinism, through, um, although they never overlap with these very elusive practices. So for example, um, it emphasizes is, um, the sh shifting individuality emerging in, in this sort of hermetic work, which was aimed at liberating this mysterious being from it's being thrown into the darkness of matter. For example, uh, this kind of work could involve the practice of Archimedean mathematics, which uh, tended to unite the opposites of divine forms and material bodies. This is particularly uh, strong in Archimedean mathematics as opposed to Euclidean geometry, or judicial astrology, or, um, for example, the uh, reconciliation of conflicting truths exemplify um, through the practice of biblical hermeneutics. Uh, the discipline of self-repression versus libertine sexuality, um, emotional self-control, um, particularly the problem of subjugating uh, the vice of anger. There are interesting documents in Galileo's early writings. He translates a Plutarch work. On, uh, on anger, um, and so on. Now, about a century ago, and here I got my first slide. There you are. So about a century ago, Antonio Favaro, the editor of the monumental multi-volume edition of Galileo's works, published a number of strange opinions and theories that were attributed to Galileo by his closest friends and, dis and disciples, but which had, had, so to speak, fallen by the wayside of history. Favaro was a staunch positivist opposing the Catholic Church in the aftermath of the political, uh, of the political unification of the Italian state in 1861. Favaro's positivist faith prevented him from making any sense of these allusion, allusions to Galileo's hermeticism that he had himself had been uh, studying and investigated. In the Domus Galileana at Pisa, uh, which is an institution founded in 1941 by the philosopher Giovanni Gentile under the aegis of the Italian fascist government, uh, with the goal of promoting historical research on both Galileo and the scientific movement originating with him, uh, there are preserved important documents from the archive of the Favaro family. Among them, there is a fascinating collection of posters that were printed in 1897 on the occasion of a social and political demonstration in Pisa against the Catholic Church. They vividly epitomize, I think, Favaro's philosophical and political outlook. This is, the, this is one of the posters, the one which I like the most. Uh, this picture shows one of the really most interesting posters. It was issued by the Peace and Workers Benefit and Education Society. It addresses Galileo as the inventor of the experimental method, a turn of phrase 
for, uh, for which Favaro himself was at great fondness. As the great astronomer condemned by the Roman Inquisition for, I'm translating the text there, for questioning the scientific authority of scriptures on matter concerning the motion of the earth. The last sentence reads, today that positive science has created this glorious pedestal. Favaro's masterful national edition of Galileo's works, this thing, beautiful. I mean, it's still, it's still available for sale. I have it. I invested two salaries when I was working in the private sector to get it. Um, Favaro's masterful national edition of Galileo's works has been the foundation of Galileo's studies ever since its completion in 1909. Yet it was a monument erected on the glorious pedestal of positivism, a representation of science that was totally alien to the 17th century life worlds and which obscured the significance of the very sparse fragments that Favaro had, col had collated towards the end of his, of his great philological enterprise. The indirect testimonies pointed to the unnerving fact that Galileo had um, numerous opinions that he was either unwilling or unable to commit to writing. Now, this situation of uncertainty casts some doubt on the significance of the books that Galileo did publish. What was their relationship uh, to his broader views? Uh, did a loose bundle of doctrines exist that Galileo desired to conceal for, from public scrutiny? Could such doctrines have something to do with the esoteric practices that Favaro must have looked like pseudo-scientific, if not blatantly occult? Now, in the, then this project, which I'm trying to, to, um, to um, develop here, revisits Galileo's life world in search of what I call the hermeticism behind his natural philosophical labors. Eventually, I will look for his practices of what I call the sublimation of the self into the divine, an ultimate, an, an ultimate spiritual goal that is suggested by the symbolism of his late poetry, as we shall see uh, towards the end of this presentation, and by his theory of light on which his pupils and friends collected some of the most interesting testimonial, testimonials that puzzled uh, Antonio Favaro. So here we are. Now then, matter. In the 1590s, Galileo jotted down notes, which he never published, collect collectively known as De Motu writings. These notes are one of the most beautiful documents in the history of science. Here, Galileo's lifelong struggle with integration of paradoxes comes to the fore. Most likely, the motto was never intended for publication. Galileo just jotted down notes by way of self-analysis, exploring the situation of fall as opposed to flotation in the context of Archimedean hydrostatics. The mystery of falling bodies cannot be dissociated from the mystery of the very being that reflects on thrownness into material body, and hence on the orderly distribution of heaviness within this material universe. Galileo cannot be satisfied with knowledge as deduction from first principles as long as he is unable to argue for the necessity of the cosmic structure which dictates the arrangement of things which we commonly experience. In other words, Galileo can only be satisfied when he can see with the intellect's natural light that gravitation necessarily causes heavy bodies to tend to the center of the cosmos. For an explanation, he grappled with two plausi plausible um, accounts. Here is a sketch of the first account. The cause Galileo discovered is at least congruent and useful to the order of nature, even though he recognizes it might ultimately not be a necessary cause. So in accord with the ancient philosophers, he assumes that there is only one type of matter for all bodies. The heavier bodies are those which include more particles of that matter in a narrower space. It is reasonable that things including more matter in a narrower place occupy narrower places such as those which are closer to the center of the cosmos. Now, suppose that at the beginning of the world, 
Nature divided all the common matter of the elements into four equal parts. Subsequently, nature assigned its own matter to the form of earth, as well as its own matter to the form of air. Galilei imagined that the form of earth constricted all its matter in the narrowest place, whereas the form of air occupied the most vast place. I'm, al I'm almost here paraphrasing Galileo's de motu. Would it not have been congruous, says Galileo, that nature assigned to air a large space, but to earth a small one? But in a sphere, the narrowest places are those which are closest to the center, and the most vast places those which recede from the center. Thus, says Galileo, nature acted very prudently in assigning the places of earth and air. However, he does not go so far as to say that the matter of water is as much as the matter of earth, and therefore that water being more rare than earth would occupy larger places. All he's saying is that if we consider a part of water which is as heavy as a part of earth, that is, if we consider as much matter of water as matter of earth, then earth will occupy a smaller place than water. So it is understandable that earth had to be placed in a narrower place. By applying the same line of reasoning to the other elements, Galileo can find a similar congruence, if not a necessity, in the arrangement of heavy and light bodies. Okay, now, second account. Here Galileo offers what I think is a creation myth. After crafting the marvelous celestial sphere, the, div the divine architect expelled its excrements, hiding them in the center of the sphere, in order that the minds of the immortal and holy spirits could not be offended. Here again, I'm just paraphrasing Galileo. However, since the densest and heaviest matter did not take up all the vast and capacious space underneath the bottommost concave of the sphere, in order that there would not be left such a vast and useless space, the architect expanded that heavy and inchoate mass, which had collapsed into such narrow gates under the pressure of its own gravity. The part of that mass that remained the heaviest and the densest as before the architect did not remove from the place where it had taken refuge. Thus, earth was left in the center. So, those parts which are denser remain closer to the earth. Of the things fashioned from this matter, denser bodies, therefore, are said to be those which include more particles of the same matter in the same volume, so that the denser turns out to be the heavier. Galileo's creation myth exposes, I think, a deeper layer of meaning in his early writings that illuminates the mystery of thrownness into matter. The creation of the celestial sphere had an, what I call an ecological impact. Excrements had been left over that could not be left untreated, as this would have offended the divine spirits. Hence, the center of the cosmos became the damping side of creation. So, thrownness is being that has been in, in, sort of enveloped in a material body which was crafted with celestial excrement in the aftermath of creation, a sort of recycled being. Thus, thrownness implies heaviness and fall. The quantities of particles of celestial excrement in a certain volume of space determines the heaviness of the body occupying that volume. The body is more or less constricted depending on how much excrement is being compressed in its volume. Hence, its nature is, is related to quality, quantity, and to, ge to the geometry of the cosmos. It is these relationships that determines the dynamism of falling downwards that appears to be the constitutive character of thrownness in the sublunary realm. So, thrownness evokes the possibility of escaping fall by flotation and or immersion coming to the surface. Archimedean hydrostatics offered the young Galileo a mathematical key to unlock the mechanics of thrownness. That is to say, offers him a toolkit to manipulate Archimedean, what I call Archimedean ideoids. So I, I did even worse. This word ideoid is not even in the OED. I have invented it, made it up. Um, <laughs> 
I coined this word to overcome this dualism of ideal and material artifact that does not really capture the processes of which the motu is, of which the demotu, demotu writings are symbol. An example of what I call an ideoid was articulated in the motu. It's a volume of solid matter immersed in a larger volume of water. What I'm saying is that you don't really understand whether Gala is talking about really material artifacts or ideas. There is this interesting ambiguity in these writings. This is a sort of indeterminacy there which you can't resolve. Hydrostatics ideoids are symbols that point to the hidden dynamism of constriction and escape to which the human body has been subjected. Knowledge of this realm opens up a new vista. Falling bodies can be manipulated by placing them in different spatial relationships to one another. By simply immersing a piece of wood in water, it can be made to move upwards, for example. It is conceivable that the human body, which, is, which envelopes a mysterious throne being, will move upwards if the arrangement of the elements in the macrocosmos could be altered opportunely. It is even conceivable that the being that is trapped inside the body will escape thrownness if the hydrostatic alteration occurs within the microcosm. During the years when the motu was being compiled in Pisa, Galileo's tutor there, uh, one Jacopo Mazzoni, reported a very interesting ancient opinion according to which Galileo was of very friendly terms with Mazzoni. He thinks and um, talks about Mazzoni as his being my teacher here in, in Pisa. So Mazzoni reported an ancient opinion according to which the physiology of defecation played a very important role in maintaining the healthy balance of imagination and ratiocination. Did I get it right? Ratiocination. The tenderness of the flesh was instrumental in favoring the rapid expulsion of the stool that might otherwise impede the intellectual faculties. Constipation is not conducive to good health, as we all know. In transposing on a macrocosmic scale the pleasures of well-lubricated defecation, the existential situation symbolized by the recurrent figures of bodies engulfing other bodies in the, in the Demoto writings contaminated Archimedean hydrostatics with the microcosmic physiology of eating, digestion, and defecation. Since the cyclic hustle and bustle of matter around the throne being was controllable with food, uh, so uh, eat well, to think well, escaping throneness by hydrostatic manipulation came under the purview of dietary regimen. Next, self. In 1602, Galileo wrote to his patron Guidobaldo dal Monte a letter concerning a claim that he uh, and dal Monte doubted, especially dal Monte. The letter conveys to him the thought that it is possible somehow to recover the truth of the claim, notwithstanding the current state of the human mind. So this is what Galileo has to say. I beseech you, to excuse my insistence in persuading you that the proposition of the motions done in equal times in the quadrant of a circle is true. For it always having, be, it always having appeared admirable to me, now I fear that it might be considered impossible by you. Thus, I would consider it my grave error and deficiency if I allowed it to be repudiated by your thinking as if it were false. Since it does not merit this qualification, let alone does it deserve to be banished from your mind, especially since you are the very person who, more than anyone else, could rescue it most quickly from the, exi from the exile of our minds. Now, the latter turn of phrase is puzzling. The text emphasizes that Guidobaldo is the right person who will be able to rescue, um, to rescue from the exile of our minds the claim that uh, the downward motions along the arcs of the quadrant of a circumference of a vertical circle from any point to the lowest one are all done in equal times. Now the letter goes on to report another claim uh, let's call it the isochronism of the chords, which unlike the isochronism of the pendulum, Galileo think, 
things that he has been able to demonstrate. And here is what he says about it. As to the fact that it seems unreasonable that one mobile might traverse a semi-circumference 100 miles long in the same time as the other goes through only a palm of it, I admit it is very admirable. But let us consider that the plane might be so little inclined, such as that of the bed of a river, which flows so very slowly, that a body along this plane would hardly traverse more than a palm's length in the time that another body on a much more inclined plane will have traversed 100 miles. Yet, this is not more incredible than the geometric proposition stating that triangles between two parallels and on equal bases are equal, even though one can make a triangle very short and another one as long as a mile. But to both to go back to our own subject, which is the isochronism of the chords, I think I've demonstrated this conclusion, which is no less certain than the other. So now let's, let's try here to see what Galileo is up to. Uh, both the isochronisms of chords and arcs and the Euclidean proposition of the equality of the triangles placed between parallel lines appear very paradoxical to Galileo. The images of impossible or incredible situation evoked in the letter are what I think symbols whose meaning is not really accessible directly to Galileo's conscious, consciousness. Here consciousness sort of circumambulates around the mysterious center by way of paradox. Now consider the diagram in the next slide here. which is taken from Galileo's letter to Guidobaldo. So, I'll give you a piece of real Galileo's reasoning here. Let the diameter AB in the circle BDA be per perpendicular to the horizon. And from point A, let lines be drawn to the, to the circumference, such as, for example, AF, a, E, A, D, A, C. I will prove that equal bodies fall in the same time along the vertical B, A, and the inclined planes C, A, D, A, E, A, F, A. Thus, if they start at the same moment from points B, C, D, F, they will arrive at the same moment at point A, no matter how small is line F, A. The following, which I have also demonstrated, may perhaps appear even more incredible. If the line is not greater than the chord of a quadrant, and if the lines S, I, I, A are taken as one pleases, the same body will, move, will more quickly traverse path S, I, A, starting from S, than the single path I, A, starting from I. Are you with me? Okay, you got exactly where Galileo wanted you to get to. So are you astonished? You should. It's counterintuitive, right? It goes faster if it follows the um, segment light trajectory. Okay. Puzzlement, confusion. Well, we'll come back to this, okay. Now, stay with the puzzlement, okay? It's good to stay with the confusion and puzzlement. Now, um, to, uh, to Guido Baldo's dismay here, Galileo's conscious consciousness has added a fourth paradox to the already very long list. Descent along the angular trajectory SIA is faster than that along the chord IA. Three of the four paradoxes include the image of a circle here. The motions of bodies by which Galileo's consciousness is fascinated are either circular motions along arcs of the circumference or rectilinear motion along chords inside the circle. The motions thems themselves are symbols. These motions never attain the center of the circle. In fact, motions toward the center such as along the red lines that I have added to the figure, they are not in the original, 
are not even represented in the original diagram accompanying the text in the letter. So, Galileo's consciousness has succeeded in integrating the paradoxical truths, but not in demonstrating the truth of the isochronism of pendulums deductively. It is this latter truth that Guido Baldo might rescue from the exile of the mind. Now, how do we think about this mysterious phrase, the exile of the mind? I take the word mind used here by Galileo to allude, whether consciously or unconsciously, to the mysterious being symbolized by the unattainable center of the circle that the circumambulation of consciousness has somehow brought to the fore. This is the unattainable self that has been exiled. If Guido Baldo or Galileo succeeded in demonstrating the truth of the pendulum isochronism, which Guido Baldo seriously doubts, the rescue operation mounted by deductive logic would recover another truth that the exiled self has brought with him, but which can only be revealed to us, to the self, as paradox. I contrast this circumambulation around the unattainable center of the circle, the exiled self, with Masoni's teaching on the perfection of the soul. Superior beings, says Masoni, have more unity than diversity and must accordingly operate following the figure of the circle. But inferior beings are involved in matter and hence full of imperfection. Therefore, they can only operate by imitating a reflected line. What a mysterious phrase. By operating, by imitating a reflected line. So, Professor Donahue, reflexam quandam lineam aemulari evidentur. Now, since they cannot reproduce the more perfect circle, says Mazzoni. On the other hand, perfect souls are conversant with intellectual, i.e. logical activities, and in this way they are in contact with the divine. Consequently, Masoni concludes, perfect souls make circles. Circulum facium, or circulum facium. See, depends on how you read it. Anyway, they make circles. What else? Circle making, aside from eating well. <laughs> the circle is. Oh, I'm sorry about this. I'm used to my, with my students to go up and down with the voice, and this doesn't work. But, okay, the circle is the symbol of the divine for Masoni, of course. But insisting on its divine perfection misses the nature of truth as integration of paradoxes. This, I think, is really Galileo's achievement. To which Galileo's consciousness is irresistibly drawn. Thus, Mathoni ignores the mysterious center and the nature of the being that has been exiled in the center. His, physio sorry, his psychology, Mazzoni's psychology, misses the self. Galileo's consciousness makes mysterious circles to explore the nature of the self. Now, I mentioned at the beginning light and Galileo's mysterious views about light. Galileo was always concerned with the experience of poetry. Poetry is a privileged locus for the fluid substance of individuality to, individuality to emerge into consciousness. Now, in this final part, I will focus on a fascinating poem written by the, the dying Galileo, I wish to examine how, in appropriating Galileo's perishing individuality, poetic language speaks through early modern natural philosophical mind. We will see that the poem is, in fact, about experience, the self, and light. In 1640, Antonio Malatesti, a Florentine jocular poet of some renown, published a book of poems entitled The Sphinx. Galileo had the poems read to him, because at the time he was totally blind. And then shortly thereafter, he composed um, and sent Malatesti a sonnet entitled Enigma. Where is the sonnet? 
And now I'll do my best to read it in English. Yeah. But with an Italian accent, it would sound even more exotic. Um, and I would like to remember here that uh, since uh, Bill mentioned uh, Curtis's article on the St. John's Review, and I, l I remember how he picked on this one particularly because he entitled the review, and I was surprised by this choice, but I thought it was so, so deep. And I thought, how wonderful. He entitled the review simply like this, Monster Am I, okay, which is the first line. Right. So, Monster Am I, stranger and more misshapen than the harpy, the siren, or the chimera. There is not a beast on land, in the air, on, or water, whose limbs are of such varied forms. No part of me is the same size as any other part. What's more, if one part is white, the other is black. I often, ha I often have a band of hunters behind me who map out the traces of my tracks. In the darkest gloom, I take my rest. For if I pass from the shadows to bright light, quickly the soul flees from me, just as the dream flees at the break of day. And I exhaust my discombobulated limbs and lose my essence along with life and name. There is nothing jocular in Galileo's sonnet which might have impressed his friend. For enigma is nothing less than a, very, a ruthless self-analysis sounding the depth of a life nearing its end. Galileo's poem stands comparison with the great Shakespearean sonnets. I mean, of course, my rendition. Uh, this is not my English rendition, but um, maybe in the Italian. I don't want to offend the Shakespeareans here. Um, it tells us something deep about individuality and universality. Galileo compares his sick, decaying body to that of a monstrous creature whose members are so deformed, disarticulated, as to deprive it of harmony. The hunters perhaps allude to Galileo's persecutors, intellectual, religious, and political. Darkness refers to Galileo's blindness. Sight will be recovered only after death, which seems to be conceived as a reawakening after, after a dream, that is, after this life. The monster is a metaphor of Galileo's individuality highlighting its consciousness, being torn asunder, tormented, incoherent. Galileo's individuality is obfuscated by darkness and chased by doubt. It's only when death occurs that the loss of personal identity that the disarticulated members of Galileo's individuality will gain renewed unity and harmony in the light of after death. The monster, monster metaphor captures the discombobulation, the jagged contour of the experience of the self. The self is really fragmentary, made up of sundry pieces, its substance loose, impenetrable to reason. A rational knowledge in this life is dream. Only after death, with the annihilation of individuality, will the escape of the exiled self its sublimation into the light of divine truth become possible. In other words, the price of human beings have to pay for truth is the loss of individuality, the undoing on the pro of the process of individuation, the renun renunciation of consciousness. The sonnet's style is dominated by chromatic contrast, light, darkness, white, black, a dualism that does not seem to harmonize well with Galileo's Christian outlook. It is reminiscent more of the black ink on white paper of Chinese calligraphy than of the chiaroscuro of Renaissance masters of disegno who taught Galileo how to draw the jagged surface of the moon. Galileo's come full circle. He recognizes that experience, reading the book of nature, is entangled with the enigma of human individuality, 
with the tension between consciousness and doubt, and that knowledge is not coextensive with, but only part of experience. His follower, Horacio Ricasso Liruccioli, reported that Galileo thought that light is the first beginning of nature, since he believed that light was the ultimate expansion, that is to say, the ultimate rarefaction of matter, the first principle from which all things would form by way of condensation, thus reaching the densest and most impenetrable compression of the hardest stone. From the vantage point of Galileo's cryptic hermeticism, I think, the testimonial uh, of this, uh, this uh, uh, disciple acquires an unsuspected significance. So now, final reflection by way of conclusion. Edmund Husserl spoke of Galileo as at once a discovering and a concealing genius who brought to the fore the true mathematical structure of reality while faithfully, though unconsciously, covering up the untruth of the immediate presence of the life world. This is in the crisis of the European sciences. He also stressed that the crisis of European sciences brought about by positivism consisted in the loss of meaning of the positive fact-minded sciences for human existence. In conclusion, I would like to suggest that Husserl's concern with the crisis of the European sciences is still very much meaningful for us today, more than 70 years later. Husserl compared science to a machine that anyone can learn how to operate correctly without in the least understanding that the inner possibility... I apologize, I have to read this again. Husserl compared science to a machine that anyone can learn how to operate correctly without in the least understanding the inner possibility and necessity of this sort of accomplishment. Though the Husserlian notion of a European science is no longer applic applicable, I think, to industrialized societies and, and global economies, the Galilean machine that was designed by European positivism has worked to obscure what I will call the numinosity of Galileo's hermeticism. It is an immense loss whose consequences will still measure today. I think it is imperative to reintegrate in our collective, con collective consciousness that numinosity if we are to revive the deeper meanings, the inner possibility and necessity of that Galileo myth for the whole of human existence. Thank you very much.